Hi. Good evening. Hi, my name's Kate James. Um, and I'm very excited tonight to uh, be able to introduce our first members show since um, last March. And um, we have had our main gallery open for um, exhibitions, but our members gallery, um, this is the uh, inaugural show since the pandemic. And we couldn't have two finer yeah. artists than um, Tracy Spadafora and Claudia Ruiz Gustafson. Um, their show tonight is called Traces of Existence. And um, I just wanna do a little intro about Concord Arts process of um, choosing artists for its members gallery shows. People always ask me, how do you put them together? Um, why do you choose to put certain artists together? So um, what happens is we have an art committee who uh, we all look at all the entries and, um, and we choose the artists that we think um, would create great shows and are ready to do that. And then we have the task of either putting um, two together or three together. We did four together once, but that was a lot. And um, I have to say that it usually, I mean, come actually always has to do with what looks good together. It's really just um, formal, it's aesthetic, and it has very little to do with themes. As it turns out though, um, the shows always look lovely, look right together, and somehow the um, artists find that their themes work well together as well. So um, that's just uh, serendipity, I'd say. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, show tonight um, that is opening and um, we're excited to present um, uses uh, different forms of collage and uh, they look wonderful together and um, the artists are very proud of the work and so are we. Um, they are both quite accomplished and they both have uh, very full art lives where they teach, they curate, they write poetry and they work in different mediums. Um, so I'd like to um, uh, invite you to come to see the show in person. Um, there's no restrictions here. We hope you did get a vaccine um, because we want you to be safe. So um, please come by and see us. So I don't think I have anything else to introduce except the artists who tonight will be giving um, presentations of their work, talking about their themes and a little bit about their process, what they, how they create them. And then we'll have a question and answer period. And I think you'll have a lot of questions because their um, work is rich with um, interesting ideas and uh, as well as interesting ways of expressing themselves. So our first artist, artist will be Claudia Ruiz Gustafson and um, Claudia, why don't you take it away? I don't want to take away any of the good material that you'll be presenting tonight. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. Uh, gracias a todos y a todas por estar aquí esta noche para nuestra charla de artista. Um, I want to especially thank Kate for selecting our work and for helping with the installation. And of course, um, to all the staff at Concord Art for all the work you do uh, supporting local artists. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, I would like to start the presentation uh, with this quotation by a, a Latin American writer. La vida no es la que uno vivió, sino la que uno recuerda y cómo la recuerda para contarla. Life is not what one lived, but what one remembers and how one remembers it to tell it. Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So when I read this quotation a few years ago, I thought that Gabriel was crazy, right? Of course, life is what you lived, uh, but it took me a few years and also the making of Historias, which is the body of work I'm gonna show you today for, in, uh, for me to kind of grasp the essence of this idea. And I'm gonna go back to this later. Um, so I would like to also share with you artists who inspire me, especially who inspired this body of work. Um, most of you know Isabel Allende and La, The House of the Spirit. Uh, this was her, her first book, 
where she portrays all the magic and the drama of the of the middle class Latin American experience, where I see myself reflected in. Um, Andrei Tarkovsky, I'm not sure he's very he's very popular here, but he uh, he was a Russian filmmaker, uh, and most of his films are based on childhood memories, and his uh, his films are really gorgeous, like no linear visual points based again on his childhood uh, growing up in Russia. And Alonso Cuaron, especially this movie, uh, was very influential uh, to me. Uh, Roma was based on his childhood memories growing up in Mexico City. And this was uh, one of the very few cases in which I saw the Latin American middle class um, reflected in a very honest way in this film. So I just want to share this with you. Uh, so before I dive into showing you images and talking about the, the work, uh, itself, I wanted to give you a little bit of background of, of, of the reason I started to create these collages. So in 2015, uh, the last one of my grandparents died. Um, it was my grandmother who was the <clears throat> family story keeper and the family storyteller. And in 2015, I was already living in the US for 15 years. And for me, there was like a, like a wake up call to look back at what I left behind because I realized that with her, a whole generation was, was gone. And of course, I, I went for her funeral and I came back with this plastic bag full of uh, photographs, full of family photographs. Um, and, you know, looking through that bag, I saw that these, you know, were these beautiful photographs of these fancy people always wearing uh, nice clothes, smiling, uh, you know, probably birthdays, uh, anniversaries, celebrating very happy moments, right? And even in the pictures where people are not looking at the camera, I could tell that everybody was, you know, posing. I had the feeling that everybody was wearing a mask. And this brought me, I don't know if they're photographers uh, tonight, but Roland Barthes was a um, French philosopher. This is a classic uh, 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 photography book. Probably all photographers have to read it at some point in their lives. So what happened is when uh, his mother died, he also went through his old photographs trying to look for her, for her mother. And all he saw were her mother wearing different masks until he found what is called a, the Winter Garden photograph, right? So I'm just gonna read a little bit here. So in all the other photos, there were too many masks. But in this one, the mask vanished. There remained a soul, ageless. It wounded me. This is what he called the punctum in photography. So we have, have to choose my winter garden photo. It'll be this one. Um, this is uh, my parents before they, um, they married, where they were dating. And I love it because, uh, first of all, I love it because they are not looking at the camera. And I love it because I could see the essence of their relationship started to, to form in those days. Um, and finally, um, the funny thing is this, 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 this photo never, never, um, it was never part of the, of the, of historias. And I'm going to go back to this idea also later. Um, so what is, uh, what I decided to do was to disrupt these images, to intervene them so that they can speak the truth. So basically I wanted to activate a narrative, like a collective memory that has been dormant. So this is my grandmother, Elsa, and she was ex an extremely uh, religious person. So I put here in, in between is her favorite prayer, Ave Maria. And um, this was actually the first time that I used color in my work. So the use of color was very intentional, um, especially the use of red is very important for me in this body of work. Uh, in this case, it is a representation of blood and the blood uh, ties the United family members. Uh, los que se fueron, the ones who left. Uh, for this project, I place objects on top of my photographs, sometimes place two images together so they are in dialogue. I have conversations with the images and sometimes reveal and sometimes uh, obscure. Um, so basically it's kind of conversations with my ancestors. And I also see that as a kind of performance that I have in with the, with the photographs. So in this case, I'm using elements that they're probably left over from a childhood party. 
is one of the first images I created. Um, here I include words from a popular Latin American song. And basically here I'm, you know, appealing to the collective memory of people who grew up in Latin America and also sort of an homage to the generation, generations of children who play in the streets, uh, something that we ra rarely see these days, even in Peru. And I don't know if there's somebody from Latin America in the audience, but in Peru, um, we have a saint for every single day of the year. Actually, instead of saying, when is your birthday? We say, when is your saint? Cuando es tu santo? Instead of saying, cuando es tu cumpleaños? And so it, there's, a, there's a saint for every problem in your life, for every disease, you know, there's somebody you can, you can pray to. And even in our families, we have our saints. This is my great grandmother, Maria, who was, um, you know, considered a family saint. And this is the way I decided to portray her, right? Maria and her shadow. I'm old enough to know that humans cannot be saints. And uh, seven stars um, represent the seven cardinal virtues and also the seven capital sins. And, um, and those are the stars that, I don't know if that happened to you, but when I was in elementary school, my teacher used to put a little star in my forehead when I was a good girl. So when I was doing research for this project, this project took five, uh, five years and includes 31 collages and also text. Um, uh, I realized that I discovered actually something that I didn't know. I discovered that one of my grandmothers was adopted. So suddenly I realized that I have no not family relation with this woman who is my great grandmother. So in this photograph uh, where I overlay myself with a text of the, the, of the Bible, I'm kind of reconnected, uh, reconnecting with her, you know, using art as a symbolic space and sort of like an umbilical cord that goes back in time through generations. In this image, I'm playing with opposites. Um, here, uh, I'm, I'm portraying my jaxes. Uh, I think in English, you call jax, right? In, in Spanish, we call it jaxes in Peru. And for me, that represents the freedom of being a girl playing in the streets. And my grandmother is in the boarding schools for young ladies, trying to um, learn how to be the perfect housewife. And for me, that's my own version of hell. So I'm like kind of like combining two elements that are opposites um, in order to tell the story of her. It's a tiny little bit of geography. Uh, this is the map of Peru. And this is the capital Lima. This is where I grew up, um, right by the ocean. My mother is from the south of Peru, right in the, in the area of, full of volcanoes, also by the ocean. And my father grew up where the Andes meet the Amazon. So the images that come from you know, either side of the family are very different. You know, when there are uh, pictures about my father is usually full of vegetation. And most of the pictures that come from my mother's side, they're by the ocean. And you can see this one that is for my father's side. Um, this was my great grandfather Raimundo, and I was very interested in his story because um, I realized that I didn't know that that he was also a photographer. So he probably took this picture, or maybe he put his camera in a tripod. I don't know. This is um, one of the uh, pieces that made itself. I was trying to play with this photograph of my grandparents and I was trying, was having a hard time figuring, figuring out how to work it in a collage. So I decided to go for a walk and I just opened the door and there was this bear lying there. So I basically put it there. And, um, and the unmade yarn is basically, is, is mimicking the unmade marriage. And I think this, um, this painting, uh, this is not my painting, it's, it's, it belongs to the Escuela Cusqueña, but I think this, this is a perfect way to explain what, what is syncretismo religioso because um, this is also kind of um, indirectly related to my work. So uh, when the Spanish um, came to, to Peru, uh, they clashed with the polytheistic religion. I mean, they brought the Catholic religion, right? And that clashed with the polytheistic religion from the native people. 
And what happened was a syncretismo religioso, right? A religious syncretism, basically a hybrid religion. And you can see that in this painting, you know, the Virgin Mary has been painted as the apple, the Pachamama, you know, the mountain. And you can still see the old deities here, the sun and the moon, and all the uh, daily scenes of, um, I think in this case, I think it was Cusco portrayed here. So basically this is the background, right? Where all the religious magical thinking in our culture or originated, right? The superstitions, the rituals, the amulets and talisman that I incorporate in my work. <clears throat> this one is titled my, my, mi abuelo y yo, my grandfather and I. And here I also combine past and present. And the symbolism of the red thread, of course, that I already mentioned represent the blood ties. And what's in, inside the red circle in my culture is protection from evil. So, um, and that's a very strong um, belief in my culture. This is uh, the games boys play. I know that most, um, most artists that I know are kind of collectors, right? In my case, um, I'm a kind of a minimalist. So for me in order to, to work on this project, there was a winter that I needed um, materials. So my father, my parents have to ship a shoebox full of objects from the family house for me to be able to work on this project. So these soldiers were in that box. And I have probably read this book three times. And um, Isabel Allende starts this book by um, telling an anecdote that is very meaningful for me. So she was giving a talk and somebody in the audience asked her if, if nostalgia has something to do um, with the way she writes about her, her, her memories of Chile. And she, doesn't, she couldn't answer that question. She, instead, she writes a book. And she says here, until that instant, I never realized that I write as a constant exercise in long. From saying goodbye so often, my roots have dried up and I have to grow other roots, which lack in a geography to sink into, they have taken hold in my memory. So when I read this, I realized that the reason I created Historias was because of, it was an, uh, an exercise of longing and nostalgia for everything that I left in Peru. And this is a body of work that wouldn't exist if I would still be living, living there. I know that for sure. And this is the last image I'm showing you. This is called um, the Transfiguración de mi Padre. Um, numbers for me are very important. So here I'm none, pom, pom, I never, never pronounce that, that fruit, pomegranate seeds. Um, and this is a lot of symbolism in this, in this image. And I would like to um, end with another quotation by a Latin American artist, uh, I mean, writer. Somos nuestra memoria. Somos ese quimérico museo de formas inconstantes, ese montón de espejos rotos. We are our memory. We are that chimerical museum of fecal shapes, that pile of broken mirrors. Jorge Luis Borges. And I would like to, um, introduce Tracy Spadafora. She's gonna be talking about her work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claudia, for the introduction. Um, it was wonderful to hear your talk because um, I've only really seen your work and I love your work, but um, it's great to hear the stories um, behind it. Um, I wanna thank uh, Concord Art and Kate and everybody at um, Concord for um, first uh, giving us the opportunity to exhibit in the members gallery and um, helping us um, with the show. Um, I wasn't familiar with Claudia's work before we were selected to exhibit together, but um, it's been a pleasant surprise to work with such a um, 
wonderful artist. And um, it also was nice to see the many connections um, her work had with my own work. So the, um, the work that I'm showing in this exhibition is from my DNA series. Um, I have always been interested in the relationship between man and the environment. And I've worked in different ways with this theme for about 20 years. Um, the DNA pieces uh, started uh, with the use of DNA sequences in the background of my paintings. Um, I like the sequences for their symbolic meaning as the building blocks of life. Um, but I also like the interesting design pattern that they made when they were put together. Um, I have, I've never liked to work with a blank canvas. Um, so for many years, I have started a painting by putting something interesting or significant in the background that I can play off of. Um, I found that working over the DNA codes uh, allowed me to create a dialogue with what I layered on top and to introduce a narrative to the work. I love to walk in the woods and collect organic materials. Um, for years, um, I only painted the natural materials that I found, um, but eventually I started to add these materials to my work, things like pods and seeds and branches. Um, I felt that these elements from nature uh, not only symbolized part of our living environment, but they also um, give a whimsical feel to the work, um, which is something that I enjoy. Um, in some of the pieces, I also add objects that introduce a human element, as you could see by um, the screws there um, and the nails in this piece. Um, and in this case, um, a human intervention. In two pieces in the show called Landmarks, um, uh, I include uh, small landscape paintings, uh, which are created with encaustic paint. Um, uh, I'm sorry, which were created with encaustic paint on a hot palette, kind of like doing a, um, a monotype. Um, and I made um, many of these landscapes in a short period of time, and I liked how the organic nature of the wax and how it flowed seemed to create um, the dramatic and mysterious landscapes sort of on its own with um, very little intervention from me. Um, it was a more intuitive process, which I enjoyed. And I chose to mount uh, some of these small landscape um, paintings inside a larger panel, uh, which was covered with DNA sequences and encaustic paint. Um, and I felt like the background acted like a frame uh, to give the small paintings more significance and more meaning. And this is another one here the small panel and then the, it mounted inside of the larger panel. So there's like a cutout that I put the smaller paint inside. Um, and I painted the inside red uh, just to get it to stand out more. When I started the DNA work, I was using a very minimal palette of black and white and, and very little or no color. Um, but after several years of black and white, I started to expand into more color. As an artist, I'm, I'm really engaged with the visual, image that I, visual images that I see around me in everyday life. Um, I take a lot of photographs, constantly documenting the art in my environment. And many of the pieces in the show incorporate my photographs of things like rusting metal, peeling paint, um, crumbling concrete, as well as natural things like leaves and bark, as you can see in these pieces called fragments.
The evolution pieces are my most colorful in this series. And the DNA code is mostly covered up, um, only peeking out in a few small areas. Um, the images of the cities that are collaged into these pieces are the human element that's introduced into the narrative. Uh, the first four evolution pieces were meant to be hung in pairs or in a group of four. So I included the same leaf element in all of them for repetition in the design. And here's a photo of all of them um, hung together as a group, um, playing off each other. Uh, these are the most recent evolution pieces that I've done, and these are meant to, to be displayed as a, a diptych um, so they can uh, communicate with one another. Also, you can see I like working with um, complementary colors. This a large piece is called uh, Leaf Archive. Um, it's composed of encaustic paint with DNA sequences and a large photograph of peeling paint, which is collaged to the surface. I chose uh, the photograph of peeling paint with blue and gray colors because it reminded me of water in a stream. Uh, the leaf images are photo transfers onto mulberry paper which were dipped into wax and, and collaged to the encaustic surface. And I have actually have some um, process shots of this particular painting. Um, so this is 36 by 36. So I start with a wooden panel. Um, I, in this particular one, I collage the DNA sequences on the surface of the wood. Um, and then I put encaustic medium over it, which is a clear wax. Um, and then I um, blew up this photograph and cut it into pieces um, and then collaged that on. And then I started to uh, paint. I uh, went with the pink, which is something, a color that I don't usually use, um, but uh, I took a chance on it and it, it seemed to work. And, um, and then you can see here, I started to attach the, the uh, leaf, um, the pieces of paper with the leaf transfers on them. Um, so, you know, I never know when I start these pieces, what's gonna happen. Um, I, I usually have an idea of what I wanna do and I have, you know, certain elements, you know, maybe collage elements or organic elements that I wanna include. Um, but I, I don't usually know until I'm making the piece um, how it's going to turn out. Um, I do like working with a grid light format um, because it allows me to separate and com uh, compartmentalize and gives the imagery more of a scientific display. And I have some detailed shots of this painting because it's pretty big. So these are the, it's mulberry paper, which has a leaf transfer on it. And then um, it's dipped into wax and it becomes transparent. So you can see what's behind it. There's a lot of layering in all my work. So after collecting rusty objects and organic materials for years, I was running out of places to store them. So I decided that I either had to get rid of them or I had to start using some in my artwork. Um, and this inspired me to try some work that was more three-dimensional, um, both in boxes and as freestanding sculpture. Um, the box pieces are called the vestige pieces, um, which refers to something that is disappearing or no longer exists. Uh, the pieces include photographs of rusting metal behind them, as well as seed pods glued over the DNA sequences. I chose to work in these grid light boxes once again to compartmentalize and to give the work more of a scientific feel.
The two sculptures in this ex exhibition are called relics um, because they are composed of mostly found rusty objects in plant matter. Um, as, as mentioned, I've been collecting rusty objects for years. Um, the objects that inspired these two sculptures were objects that were found on the side of my house, um, actually where my studio now sits. Um, and the previous owners of the house used to use the yard as a landfill. So there have been many interesting um, objects that have emerged from the ground over the years. Um, I had fun upcycling these rusty objects and giving them a new whimsical purpose in my art. Um, in general, while, while each of, of um, well, they each have their own individual narrative or message. I, I feel that all my pieces in this exhibition speak to our common underlying history and our connection to the environment. And I'm going to end with a photograph of a cast iron radiator that was found in my backyard when I was planting something. Um, that didn't make it into my studio to become a piece of art. That ended up in the landfill. <laughs> And I want to thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank I think you, we're going to, oh, oh, go ahead. No, thank you guys so much. Are you guys ready to move on to Q&A at all? I think so, awesome. Let me just spotlight myself too, just for fun. <laughs> All right, let me see. I have a couple of questions in here. So our first question we have, and of course, just letting you know, if anyone else has any other questions, we definitely encourage you guys to still put them in the chat as we go along. Thank you so much. Uh, this first question is for Claudia. How old were you when you first moved to the US? And do you think that you would have made this work if you still lived there? Or did, did the immigration experience help shape your work? Oh, just unmute yourself, okay? There you go. Yeah, I was in my uh, 26 or 27 and um, when I moved here and I didn't intend to stay, <laughs> uh, but I did. Um, I know, uh, actually when I, when I, uh, when I read, a, when I talk about a book from Isabella Allende about nostalgia, that's when I realized that the whole body of work was, was an exercise of longing and nostalgia for all my, um, for everything that I left from my family, um, uh, from my land, um, uh, because I, I'm the only one from my family that, um, immigrated immigrated so no it wouldn't you know, I wouldn't I don't think I would have created that body of work if I would still be living in Peru for sure I, I don't think so no good yeah it makes sense good this next question is for Tracy are the DNA codes the codes of the objects in the artwork or are they just kind of more randomly put together codes would you say oh just unmute yourself too there you go Thanks. I always get that question. Um, so uh, they are, well, they sort of started off as random and then I got access to a, um, uh, a library where you could find, you know, whatever DNA code that you want. Um, so I was using the code of uh, trees and organic things, uh, plants. Um, and that's mostly where it comes from. Um, so, but the problem is like when you're, when you're putting it together to fit on a, a panel or something, you, you know, you're, you're having to kind of splice it together and, and it, you know, to fit it. And so, you know, I, it doesn't necessarily just read from, you know, beginning to end as the code of a, you know, whatever birch tree or whatever. So, um, you know, it, I, most people can't read it anyway. So um, it's, you know, really more of a symbolic thing, 
you know, but I, I felt better putting, you know, code that relates to the objects in it. It works really well with like all of your compositions that you, especially the font you chose, especially for it just works really beautiful. So just accolades, accolades. Uh, so for Claudia, uh, I got a question who in the piece with you and your grandfather, there is another child in the work and do you, who is the other child? And then is there any particular reason you just decided to skip over that child? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that was uh, the title of that of that piece is my grandfather and, and I and I wanted to uh, emphasize my relationship with my grandfather that that was amazing and when I give an artist talk a uh, couple of years ago I said that um, I don't know if parents have a favorite child because I only have one but I know for sure grandparents do have favorite grandchildren <laughs> And I knew that I was uh, his, um, his favorite one. So I covered my brother because um, he kind of um, didn't care much about him. It was, our relationship was, was really amazing. And um, in, uh, I said that this body work also has uh, uh, text. So um, I, I tell the story of my grandfather picking it up every Sunday, will hold hands, go to the park seat and look at the pigeons for hours without talking. So that was our relationship. So yeah, so that, that's just about the two of us, yeah. That's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, can I can relate to the, when you're just kind of casually the favorite grandchild. <laughs> so this is a question for both of you guys and you can answer in whatever order you consider most appropriate. Um, could you explain how you both came to the title of your exhibition, Traces of Existence? Like go into that with some detail. Oh. Whoever would like to go first. <laughs> um, Ooh, Tracy, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> that was I last year. I actually do remember. I, oh, good. <laughs> so, you know, we, I don't, I, I wasn't familiar with Claudia's work and I don't know if she was familiar with, with mine, but what we ended up doing was we, you know, so looked at each other's websites and um, just saw what we did. And then, you know, I read her statement, she read my statement. Um, and, and that's when we kind of realized, oh, we, you know, we have a lot more in common than just a visual connection in our work. You know, there's definitely some things that are overlapping here. So we basically pulled out uh, similar uh, words and, and, or phrases in, in both of our artist statements and kind of write, wrote them down. And then we worked with that until we came up with the, the title. It took a while, yeah. you know, it was, yeah. but it was back and forth. And we both, um, you know, really was a, a combined effort to, to yeah. figure it out. Um, now remember, we had a lot of finalists. <laughs> we had like three or four, and then finally uh, this one was the one. Yeah. Um, it's gorgeous. It's really gorgeous. Yeah, and I think that yeah, the title really does make the connection, and and uh, mm -hmm. I'm very happy with the title. Yeah, awesome. True. So this is also, I think, a good question. Um, I believe for Tracy, is the encaustic method possible to kind of explain from your perspective, like explain how you use it, what it's like, et cetera, like going into detail about what it's like to work with encaustic? Um, yeah, I, I've been using encaustic for over 20 years. Um, I teach it, um, hopefully I'll teach it at Concord Art in the fall or whenever we're open up for um, in-person workshops. Um, so uh, it's basically you're melting wax on a hot uh, palette and uh, you know they add color to the wax by putting pigment into, into it. So it's beeswax with, with um, pigment in it. And um, you know you have to heat it in order to use it. So you're working with hot wax, you can brush it on a panel and you can heat it up with heat guns or torches um, and it's just, really interesting material. I, I started working with it years ago when I worked for um, the company RNF Handmade Paints. And um, this was while I was in graduate school. And I 
just fell in love with the process, which is why I've been teaching it for so long. Um, but it allows me to do um, the, the kind of layering and, and excavating and, and, you know, that kind of thing with, with the imagery that is, is so important to my work. Um, and that's why I like using it, especially for these, these pieces, it, it's really, um, it, the medium really works for me. I don't just use encaustic though too. I, I often use oil on top of it and obviously collage and other things. I that, think need to try encaustic. So fingers crossed for more encaustic at Concord Art. So this is for both of you guys. Um, and I think the way it'll work is like I'll maybe Claudia answer this first and then Tracy second, just to mix it up a bit. When did you first consider yourself like an artist and what has your journey been to evolve to this point in your career? Um, yeah, it's funny. I've been a photographer since I was in college and I always called myself a photographer, but I started calling myself an artist only when I started uh, doing more conceptual work, artistic way, because when I was a photographer, you know, I was like a photojournalist, documentary, and I never thought of that as an art form. Um, it was not until I think it was 2011 that I started, that I took a class at the Griffey Museum of Photography. And I was like, it was like eye opening, like, oh my God, so I can use photography to express myself. For me, it was like a revelation. And ever since I call myself a visual artist, I don't call a photographer. I don't call myself a photographer anymore. So, um, yeah, did I answer? I think, yeah. Oh, it's okay. a natural That's transition. It. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, that was, that was it for me. The rest is history. Mm -hmm. Tracy, well, you Tracy. I don't remember when I first started calling myself an artist, but um, I have done art my whole life. I was really into art when I was a kid. Um, and I, when I went to, I did a lot in high school when I was gonna go to college, I, there was no doubt that I was gonna go for art. Um, so it's just, I feel like it's always been part of my, my life. And um, yeah, so I went to college for art and then I went to graduate school. And so I kind of just did that, that thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just been always part of my DNA. <laughs> so. I relate to that. Sometimes you have no choice. <laughs> so, it chose me. I didn't choose it. <laughs> yeah, same. So also for Tracy, when you deal with the interference of nature and culture, do you identify with one or the other, or is the interaction between the two, is it the interaction between the two that interests you? Um, it's definitely the interaction, you know, our, our, our place in the environment, you know, our relationship to the environment. Um, there's a lot of questions. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm very concerned about environmental issues, um, but, you know, I, I understand the, the way the world is. And um, so I feel like in my work, it's, it's about presenting larger questions about, you know, okay, so, how are we going to deal with this? What is, are we gonna remember our roots and, and how are we gonna go forward um, in, in, you know, taking care of our environment and, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, I have done work, not really as much in this show that, that was more, a little bit more didactic in its um, message about the, you know, envir environmental concerns. Um, but this is a little bit more open to interpretation. I kind of want people just to be thinking about it. Yeah. Nice. Oh, good. So for Claudia, do you always work with such personal materials and your personal materials, or is this kind of a new avenue for you in your work? Um, that was the first time I did collage, the first time that I used archive. Mm -hmm. uh, now I, th I feel like my my work, uh, because I was such a latecomer to art, I feel like I'm producing a lot of work 
like one body of work per year. And I feel like right now my body of my, my work is moving very, very fast into more um, political uh, areas. And I'm still working with an archive. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm now even working closer to Peru because now I need to go to Peru in order to produce this work. So um, yeah, also archive, but more uh, more intentional, more political, I guess. That's, that's, that's where I'm heading. That's a cool evolution. We also have another question about <laughs> the piece with you and your grandfather and your brother. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're they're wondering if your brother has seen the piece and reacted to it in any yes, way. Yes, he, he's not <laughs> happy. He's definitely not happy about that. Um, <laughs> you got people curious. <laughs> It's, it's it does, that's a tough work the whole there's a lot of pieces that there's a couple of pieces where I cannot even talk about it if I know they are in the zoom meeting or if they are yeah. present in the room mm. so because you know people are still alive it's not that I'm working with dead people you know most of yeah. them are still alive so I have to be careful so yeah yeah no hey that explains it and also a patron, we had a patron in the gallery come to the gallery today and noticed uh, elements of both Peru and Spain in your work. Um, the question is, are you interested in the relationship between Peru and Spain and using that in your work as well? Like how interested are you, would you say? Um, Spain, I think it comes uh, because I, I am a, a, a Peruvian of mixed race, um, Spanish and native uh, native Peruvian. So a lot of my ancestors uh, came as an, 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 as, an, an, as immigrants um, from Spain. So um, I think there's a map to some of them where I where I put exactly where they came from. Um, I don't think that's very present in that in that work. It's actually that in the work that I'm working right now, because it's about uh, decolonizing uh, my history. I'm talking, I'm referring a lot about Spain in, in the term of the, the conquistadores and um, the exploitation and all that, but I don't think it's very present in historias. It's much present in my current body of work that is in progress. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. So for one more for Claudia, when you incorporate family photos, are you using the originals or making copies and what kind of photo, like what kind of materials, photocopies or photographic paper, they love the uh, Ave Maria collage. Yeah, and like my grandfather and I, my abuelo yo, the one that, 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 in that one I used the original because I didn't have to damage it. I just put the yarn on top and photograph it. But yeah. when, I, when I know I'm going to damage it, like in one case, occasion, I have to burn the photograph, I create a copy. All I do is just print it again. Um, and then I, I, I can burn it or I can break it because I, I don't have negatives. I only have the original, so I don't want to destroy them. Uh, yeah. yeah. Make that, that makes sense, too. Yeah. And then I have a question for you guys before we start wrapping up. Um, there's like one or two more after this, but I would love to kind of hear more from your perspectives, what the process was like of making certain pairings in the gallery, because the whole show in general is very cohesive, but there's certain pairings in the gallery that just really work beautifully together. Do you guys want to maybe talk about more how you came to those decisions and what the process was like? Whoever wants to go first, maybe Tracy. Well, I can say that Claudia did all the work on that. She um, she actually came up with the pairings a long time ago. <laughs> we were supposed to do this show actually in March of uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, she when she found we were paired together and we were looking at her work, she came up with the pairings, um, which I thought was great. Um, and uh, I loved her choices. And so she had already, had them so when we went into gallery the gallery to hang the show we just tried to include as many of those pairings as possible and i think we were able to include just, all of them oh i'll oh, write oh, most of them or maybe there's one or something we didn't but um i think we yeah we got so we yeah. were, were lucky that the it just worked out that way so maybe claudia wants to tell you about how she did the pairings yeah uh 
can I share my screen very quickly because I have the parents here. Of um, course, please do. Um, so basically, well, this parent is the 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 parent. I was um I was surprised the way uh, our our work was so visually connected. Like she has. I mean, I use this because I sometimes I incorporate pieces of my journal, pieces of photograph, and I noticed that she also does the same thing, and also with colors. Um, in this case, too, this is a piece of my journal, cherries, and also she has this, which is, was like, you know, very beautiful to put to put together. And she has this leaf here. Um, I also have this these leaves here coming up. So I felt like this was meant to be together. And I think that Kate James, I think Kate, you saw that. She saw this and um, and we discovered this. For us, was a, from, for us it was a discovery. Um, I know the way they came together. And I love this, it's like a Ferris wheel, which is child, uh, about the, the childhood memories. And this is perfect because my work is about childhood memories. Uh, in this case, especially those two um, images. And again, this, this little thing that I do, and she does too, and the colors. Um, uh, I don't think I have showed this one, but this was the blue one, uh, which again, she has this little piece of collage and I have my piece of an old painting. So I think we were able to, to do all of them, Tracy. It was like amazing that it worked out. This is like a triptych. And then we put it here. Um, and the main yarn that I mentioned with the dead bear, and she has this, which is like so um, beautifully pairing. Yeah, some of them look like they were just meant to be together. I know, yeah. I was going to say, some of these just look so natural. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, and this was the, uh, this is the last one I'm showing you. And this is also the, the pomegranate, pomeg oh my God, I can never pronounce our word, pomegranate seeds. And, um, and this one, which are these? What are these one, Tracy? Uh, those are water chestnuts. Oh, okay. So seeds, um, and they're here. Oops. They're both, they're both, they all like naturally pair together, but they still work wonderful as standalone pieces. So I just had to ask you guys, it was yeah. beautiful. So there, I, we, I'll do two more questions before we close. Tracy, your landmark paintings are so compelling. Will you be making more work like those, more like the landscapes? Um, yeah, most likely. I mean, I do have a, a lot of the small um, pan landscape panels, and I'm I still do them um, once in a while. I it's a nice change from some of the other work. So I started doing those. Um, I call them my actual my evolve pieces. Um, and it's a, it's a very different way of working than this much more methodical um, cognitive way that I layer in, you know, those are just purely, they're playful. You know, I, I mean, there is a process, but, it, but what you end up with is a mystery. You know, I, when it's cause I say, I do them like uh, monotypes. Um, so I take a panel and I put gesso on it and then I put them down on the palette and then I lift it up and I, you know, kind of play around with it and, and see what I get. And um, so I like that playful process and I feel like I have to have that in my art, you know, so if I'm doing a series of work, which involves a lot more, you know, um, detail or attention or something like that, I can go to these other ways of working to get a break from that. <laughs> um, but they also, they generate new ideas. So I think play in the studio is, is always important because um, that's how you, you know, eventually break off into other series of work. Oh, absolutely. And I thought this question that we got a little earlier was a really nice closing question for tonight. Uh, starting with, it's for both of you, but maybe we can start with Claudia. What advice do you give emerging artists and how do you encourage others to explore their creativity? Um, yeah, I, I actually do have an advice for emerging artists. It took me a while for me to understand. Um, 
art is not about creating art in isolation. Art is about sharing it with, with a community. So find your people, find a, 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 a like-minded group of people and, and, and be part of a group, like be part of a place like Concord Art because uh, art is about sharing and don't wait for people to choose your work. You put together, you put together shows and knock doors. And this have to be in galleries, could be coffee shops, could be in libraries, because art is um, art doesn't have to be elitist. Art it has to be democratic. Everybody needs has the right to show. And you know, sometimes you you people are big deals about awards and things like that. That's not important. What's important is to make art, create community, and and yeah, that's that's it. Beautiful. Thank you. Tracy, you want to add? Um, well, I really like what she said. <laughs> um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I second that. Um, uh, yes, it's, um, it's good. You got to get your work out there. And, uh, but make a lot of it. Just keep making stuff. And don't worry about what people think or if it's good enough or, or any of that. You just got to keep making stuff. And, you know, you'll find a place for it eventually. Um, and, and, you know, I think if you're compelled to make things, you know, make things and, and look at a lot of things because that will inform your work. The more things you see, the more ideas you get and, um, and, and, and be personal. Like, I think that's, that's what we have to give as artists, we have our own experience. So don't try to be like somebody else. Try to be like yourself. Absolutely. And um, and if you do that, you'll be fine. Absolutely. Thank you won't you be all. you won't be rich, but you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, both beautiful statements. Thank you both so much. Those thank you so much. Yeah, Thank fabulous you. answers, and uh, it's definitely it's been such an it's such an awesome show to have in our space, especially since this is the first member show we've had, basically since we went into lockdown. So okay. I cannot encourage people more than ever to come and see it in person. I will pass the mic, virtual mic, over to our fabulous director Kate James, and she'll lead us out. Um. That was, a, that was beautiful. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm gonna miss these virtual openings because they're so much more personal and I learned so much more about the art, artwork than I do at a noisy, busy, in-person opening. So we're gonna have to incorporate um, the, the uh, intimacy, strangely enough, the intimacy of Zoom <laughs> when we go back to in-person. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Have a lovely evening. The weather is fantastic. And you artists, you really acted yourself. This is a lovely, lovely show. It's really great. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Bye.